Hello and welcome to Animal Sciences 142, Anatomy and Physiology of Domestic Animals. Today is our first lecture and that's going to be an introduction to the field of anatomy and physiology. So after you complete today's lecture, you should be able to define the terms anatomy and physiology. You should be able to differentiate between different approaches to studying anatomy, for example, microscopic anatomy versus macroscopic anatomy. You should understand the different levels of biological organization going from atoms to cells to tissues and all the way up to the organism. You should be able to define the characteristics that define all living organisms and also define the term homeostasis as it's very important to understand physiology. We're also going to describe the four different anatomical planes of reference and we're going to talk about directional terms and anatomical regions of domestic animals. And finally, at the end of the lecture, we're going to list the four basic types of body tissues. Okay, we should probably start out today's lecture with a definition of anatomy and physiology, since that's the name of the course. Well, as you probably already know, anatomy has to do with the structure or parts of a living organism. For example, if you take a look at this diagram of the horse here, you can see all the different bones in the horse, and these, of course, are part of its anatomy, in addition to the muscles, the organs, and so forth. So there's all different types of anatomical structures in vertebrate animals. Now, physiology, on the other hand, is the functions of those particular body parts. For example, what's the function of the humerus, or the radius, or the ulna? They all have particular functions. Now, one of the core concepts of anatomy and physiology is the complementarity of structure and function. And what this basically means is that the function, or physiology, of a particular structure is dependent on the anatomy, or uh, the shape of that structure. For example, let's take a look at the structure at the lower right. This is the knee, otherwise known as the stifle joint. It's made up of three different bones. Up top, we've got the femur. Down below, we've got the tibia, the fibula as well, but also the patella. So depending on looking at it, three to four bones. Now, everybody knows what a stifle joint or a knee joint looks like, but you probably also know that they have a particular function as well. If you take a look at the picture of the greyhound running at left, you can see that it has a particular way in that it runs in which the stifle or knee joint bends and flexes and then extends again. Now the important point is that the knee can flex backwards so that the angle becomes acute, but it cannot extend forward beyond 180 degrees. And this is because of the arrangement of various ligaments around the knee. They allow it to flex and have great force in doing so, but they don't allow it to extend uh, very far without tearing itself. And so this is important to realize that the knee is a very good example of the complementarity of structure and function. Basically, structure determines function. Now, there's a lot of different ways to study the field of anatomy. Oftentimes, you've heard the term gross anatomy. In this case, gross means large. It doesn't mean icky or gooey, although sometimes it is. So gross anatomy is the study of large body structures that can be observed with the naked eye. For example, if you're taking the lab for this class, you're going to be doing a dissection on a cat. And during that dissection, you'll be able to, to observe the muscles, the heart, the lungs, the blood vessels. This is all part of macroscopic anatomy. Now, macroscopic or gross anatomy can be divided into regional or systemic anatomy. Regional anatomy is where we look at all the body structures in a particular region. For example, we might look at the brachium or the arm, and we might want to look at the muscles, the nerves, the blood vessels, everything that's in that structure. That would be an example of a regional approach. On the other hand, another way to do it is to take a systemic approach. That is, we look at the anatomy by body systems, and that's what we're going to do in this course. You're going to start out looking at the skeletal anatomy, which is part of the skeletal system. Then you're going to move to the muscular anatomy, or muscular system, and so on, and so on, and so on. So we're going to take a systemic approach. Now, another approach to studying anatomy is to study microscopic or microanatomy. Now, as the name implies, micro just means really small. So usually, microanatomy is something we're observing with a compound microscope, or sometimes even an electron microscope. And so microanatomy can be divided into two different fields, cytology, the study of cells, and histology, the study of tissues. 
For example, as future vet techs and vet assistants, some of you will be looking at cytology from the ears of cats and dogs. If you have a dog that's been itching its ear a lot, one of the things you want to look at is see maybe there's some yeast in there, maybe there's some bacteria in there. So you're going to take a swab through that ear, put it on a microscope slide, stain it, and see what you can see under the microscope. That's an example of a cytological observation. Histology, on the other hand, talks about whole tissues. So let's say that we have a dog that has a suspected tumor and that we take a punch biopsy of that tumor, we section it, and we place it on a microscope slide. Now that would be an example of a histological observation. Okay, another approach to studying anatomy is to look at developmental anatomy. Basically, developmental anatomy examines the change in structures of the body throughout the life period. So starting from a fertilized egg, going through the embryo, uh, the fetus, and eventually the neonate. And just like humans, there's profound changes in the anatomy of both cats and dogs and even horses uh, throughout this developmental period. Okay, we already said before that physiology tends to cover the function of particular body organs or body systems. And in most cases, we need to do a physiological study on a living organism, whereas we can do an anatomical study on a preserved specimen or even a dead animal. Usually physiology is done with live tissues, live animals. And physiology, like anatomy, is a very old science. It goes back several hundred years. In fact, here's a picture of one of the first uh, physiologists working on animal physiology. And this is a guy by the name of Hales. And Hales was the first person to accurately document the blood pressure inside of a horse. Now, back then, he didn't have the traditional blood pressure cuffs that we have now. And so he had to take a more invasive approach he basically took his faithful horse, he severed its carotid artery, and inserted a long glass tube in the artery, and then watched how high the blood in the tube rose. And as it turned out, it went pretty darn high, some seven feet. And so this was the first accurate estimation of blood pressure in any mammal. Now, obviously, we can't go around doing that in the veterinary clinic because uh, when you sever the carotid artery, that's pretty much uh, a terminal procedure. So through the work of Hales and others, we eventually devised blood pressure cuffs that can be used for non-invasive measurements of blood pressure. And so those cuffs that we use now uh, in the veterinary clinic uh, are actually developed using the technology first developed by Hales back in 1733. Now, as I said earlier, physiology tends to focus on the function of particular body systems. We've already named a couple of them, the cardiovascular system, which is the heart and blood vessels, but there's also the endocrine system, the urinary system. So if you take a look in your textbook in chapter one, there's a nice table that shows all the different body systems and summarizes their organs and functions. So please take a look at this table in your textbook. All right, now that we've covered the different approaches to studying the field of anatomy and physiology, we're going to go back and talk about some very basic core concepts that pertain to both anatomy and physiology. The first of these is to learn the levels of biological organization. As you probably already know, uh, living organisms such as yourself and a cat and a dog are fairly complex. They're made up of smaller parts such as organs, and these organs are made up of smaller parts such as cells and tissues, which themselves are made up of smaller parts. So we're going to go through each of these levels of biological organization, and when we're done, you should have a very good overview of the different parts making up a living organism. Okay, so starting down at the lower end of the spectrum, we have the atom. The atom is the smallest particle of any element that still exhibits the chemical and physical properties of that element. For example, think about the element gold. It's shiny, it's lustrous, it's ductile. So theoretically, if you had a bar of gold and you could divide it into smaller and smaller pieces, theoretically, you could get down to the level of the atom. Now, we know that that's not possible using ordinary means, but the point here is that atoms still have the same physical and chemical properties. Once we break the atoms apart, then they cease to have those properties. So all matter, whether animate, that is living, or inanimate, non-living, is made up of atoms. And we'll talk more about these on our chapter on chemistry. Going one level above the atom, we have the molecule. A molecule is a combination of two or more atoms held together by chemical bonds. For example, this Mickey Mouse looking molecule you see here is water. Water is made up of two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. It's important to note that the compound or molecule may have very different properties than the elements that make it up. For example, think about hydrogen. Well, that's a flammable gas. Oxygen, that's an oxidizer and certainly something you don't want to get around a flame. 
but when we combine these two elements together to make a molecule, it can have very different chemical properties. In fact, we can use water to extinguish a fire rather than starting one. The next higher level of biological organization is something called a cell. A cell is the smallest structure that shows all the characteristics of life. For example, cells can reproduce, they contain genetic information, they can regulate their own physiological processes. And so cells in general tend to be fairly small and we'll talk about why in just a few more slides. Now within cells we find cellular organelles. Organelles are small membrane bound structures that perform specific functions within the cell. So really you should think about them like cellular organelles. For example, there are structures in the cell that help to generate energy. These are called the mitochondria. They help to generate ATP. There's also sort of the brain of the cell known as the nucleus that contains the DNA and RNA that help the cell to replicate and also to direct its activities. And also we have something called endoplasmic reticulum which helps the cell to synthesize proteins, lipids, and also to detoxify certain compounds in the body. We'll talk more about cells and cellular organelles in a couple more chapters. Now going one level beyond the cells we have the tissues. Tissues are groups of similar cells that are specialized to perform a specific body function. There are four main types of tissues in the body. These include muscular tissue, connective tissue, epithelial tissue, and nervous tissue. Now muscular tissue is a no-brainer. We all know that that helps uh, our muscles to contract and help to generate movement. Epithelial tissue, on the other hand, is found covering body surfaces and also lining body cavities. For example, the surface of the skin is made up of epithelial tissue. Connective tissue, on the other hand, is found beneath epithelial tissue. And connective tissue includes a diverse range of tissues, for example, blood, bone, cartilage, and so on. And finally, we have nervous tissue. Now, nervous tissue, of course, helps to transmit information in the form of electrical impulses throughout the body. And so it allows body organs to communicate with one another, and it also allows us to control our muscular tissue. We'll talk more about tissues in a couple chapters. Going one level further, we have the organs. Now, an organ is a unit formed by two or more tissues that are joined together to carry out a specific body function. For example, the organ we have pictured here is the stomach, and the stomach is very important in helping to process food for digestion and absorption. So the stomach is composed of multiple different types of tissue. For example, if we look at the inside lining of the stomach, we find that it's made up of epithelial tissue. Below that, we're going to find blood vessels that are embedded in connective tissue and below that we'll find a lot of muscular tissue. Anybody knows that when your stomach churns or moves around it's because of muscular contractions of smooth muscle within the stomach wall. And finally we also have a lot of nervous tissue within the stomach and also within the GI tract as a whole. When you hear people saying that you need to think with your gut, there's a little bit of truth to that because we actually have more nervous tissue uh, in our digestive tract than you do in the spinal cord. Although it's important to point out that this is not voluntarily controlled. We'll talk more about each of these four tissue types in a coming chapter. If we go one level beyond the organ, we have organ systems. Now organ systems are made up of groups of organs that work together to perform vital body functions. For example, we already talked about the stomach, which is one of the organs of the digestive system. Together with the mouth, the pancreas, the large intestine, small intestine, uh, these organs help to digest and assimilate the food that we eat and that our animals eat as well. Other examples of body systems include the reproductive system, uh, which includes the gonads, the circulatory system, which includes the heart and blood vessels, and many others as well. So be sure to take a look at the table in your textbook that discusses each of the body systems. And finally, the highest level of biological organization that we're going to cover in this class is the organism. The organism is the living individual, for example, a cat, dog, or horse, uh, that contains multiple organ systems. And each of these organ systems is made up of several different types of organs. And the organs themselves are made up of tissues. And the tissues are made of cells, and so on and so on. So hopefully, we've given you a brief overview of the different levels of biological organization. Okay, we're going to shift gears now and spend a few minutes talking about the characteristics of living organisms. Now we already said that living organisms are made up of cells and that cells are the smallest unit of life that still show many of the properties of life. And we said earlier that cells are small, but really how small are they? Well, it turns out they're very small.
If we look at a mammalian blood cell, something like in a cat or a dog, we see that the cell size is somewhere between 5 to 8 microns. And a micron is 1 1,000th one of a millimeter. And so what we have here is a cell that's about 1 200th of a millimeter in width. And the reason they're so small is that small cells have a greater surface area in proportion to their volume. And this helps them to move things in and out of the cell much easier than if they were a larger cell. For example, red blood cells are able to move oxygen in and out of the cell very efficiently because of their small size. Now if we go one level higher, we see that a mammalian egg cell, or oocyte, is around 100 microns, or one-tenth of a millimeter. This is still pretty small and probably couldn't be seen with the naked eye, but it's a lot larger than a red blood cell. Now at the very high end of the spectrum, we have bird eggs or chicken eggs, and these are extremely large cells. An average chicken egg is around 65 millimeters or 65,000 microns, and obviously these are large enough to be seen with the naked eye, and they are freakishly large cells as cells go. And the reason they have to be so large is that bird eggs tend to have to store all the nutrients, that is the yolk protein, carbohydrate, and so on, needed for that developing embryo to go through all stages of development and hatch out as a fetus. On the other hand, if we look at a mammalian egg, we see that it's quite a bit smaller because it doesn't have to contain all those raw materials for growth and development. That's because mammalian eggs will eventually hatch and form a placental connection with the maternal organism. So the take-home message here is, with a few exceptions, cells tend to be very, very small in order to better regulate the movement of things into and out of the cell. Okay, another characteristic of living things is that they have a metabolism. Metabolism is basically the sum total of the chemical processes that occur in a living organisms that result in growth, production of energy, and elimination of waste materials. So metabolism can be divided into two separate processes, anabolism and catabolism. Anabolism is a building process whereby we take smaller molecules and with the input of energy, we join those smaller molecules together to make a larger molecule. For example, when your dog is absorbing nutrients from its food, it will take the individual amino acids in those foods and join them together to make complete proteins. Now these proteins will be incorporated into the dog's uh, muscle tissue and skin and so on. And so this is an example of an anabolic process. Now the way that I remember anabolism is to think about the word anabolic. Where have you heard that before? Well, probably with anabolic steroids, which of course are the hormones that we use to jack people up at the gym and so forth. So if you see a guy that looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger, or maybe even a dog that looks like the dog at right, you might think, wow, that dog's on anabolic steroids, and they help to build muscle tissue by joining together smaller molecules into bigger molecules. Anabolism. Catabolism, on the other hand, is the reverse process. That's where we take a very large molecule and break it down into smaller components. For example, think about uh, a carbohydrate molecule. A carbohydrate molecule can be very large, particularly if it's a starch molecule, but through the digestive process, it gets broken down into monosaccharides or simple sugars. In the process, we extract some energy from that catabolic process. So catabolism is the breaking down of a large molecule into smaller molecules. And the way that I remember catabolism is to think about cats. What would happen if you threw a whole bunch of cats uh, into a room with a bunch of brand new furniture? If they're like my cats, they're going to shred it to pieces and break it down into smaller and smaller parts. Hence the term catabolism. Okay, another characteristic of living organisms, or at least vertebrates, is sexual reproduction. And of course, sexual reproduction is where we have a male and a female organism, and they contribute either a sperm or an egg, which fuse together to make a fertilized egg known as a zygote. And that zygote will develop into the offspring, whether we're talking about baby turtles or baby dogs or baby cats, etc. The big important point to take away with sexual reproduction is that it generates offspring that are genetically distinct from either one of the parents. And that's because the offspring contains genes of both the male and the female parent. And this is important because we think this recombination of genes helps organisms to uh, deal better with uh, changing environments and makes them less prone to extinction. We'll talk more about sexual reproduction at the end of the course when we cover the reproductive systems. Another characteristic of living organisms is they undergo growth and differentiation. In the last slide, we talked about the fact that an egg and a sperm get together to make a zygote. But in fact, the zygote is just the beginning of this developmental process.
the zygote will divide continuously until it makes something called an embryo, and that embryo will eventually morph into something that looks like a fetus. And by the time that fetus is ready to be born, we'll be calling it a neonate or newborn, which looks like a little puppy or a little kitten. Now, the puppy or kitten doesn't look like an adult because it will further undergo growth and differentiation until it becomes an adult dog or cat. So growth and differentiation are going on both in the prenatal period and also the postnatal period. And finally, the last characteristic of living organisms is something called homeostasis. And homeostasis is the ability of the body to maintain a relatively stable internal environment even though the external environment might be fluctuating. For example, think about temperature regulation. In Hawaii in the summertime, the outside temperature can be quite extreme. For example, it's been in the high 80s every day for the last week now. Now, that's pretty uncomfortable if you're inside the house. But if you're like me, you've got an air conditioning system. So that when the internal temperature in your house reaches a certain threshold, let's say 80 degrees, your air conditioner will turn on and then bring that temperature back down. Once your temperature in the house gets back down to a certain set point, the air conditioner should turn off, and this keeps it from getting too cold. This is sort of an analogy for how homeostasis works in the body. So the way that we maintain homeostasis in the body is through something called a feedback system. A feedback system is a cycle of events in which information about the status of a controlled condition is continuously monitored and reported to a central control region. For example, in the last slide, the controlled condition that we were monitoring was the room temperature of our house. And that was being reported back to a control center, which is the thermostat on your air conditioner. So any disruption in that controlled condition is called a stimulus. For example, if the set point of your thermostat is right at 75 and room temperature starts to raise to 80 degrees because it's hot outside, this would be an example of a stimulus. Now, in order to detect that stimulus, we have to have a receptor. A receptor just basically monitors the controlled condition, in this case, room temperature. And again, in your house, that receptor is going to be in the thermostat. And the thermostat is going to record that information and report it back to a microchip uh, in the control center. And the control center will determine how far out of whack your controlled condition is and what it needs to do about it. For example, if your set point was right at 75 degrees, and let's say the room temperature begins to rise to 80 or 85 degrees, eventually that control center in your thermostat will send a message towards an effector, in this case the air conditioner, to do something about that. So your thermostat turns on the air conditioner, the air conditioner cools down the room, and brings our room temperature back down to that 75 degree set point. So this is an example of a negative feedback system. So a negative feedback system is a system in which the response of the effector reverses the change in the controlled condition. For example, our temperature in our house, which was initially set at 75 degrees, began to increase because of the ambient heat outside. Your air conditioner turns on and brings that back down to 75 degrees again. This is an example of a negative feedback system. And negative feedback systems are the most common type of feedback in the mammalian body. Rarely we'll have something called a positive feedback system. A positive feedback system is where the response actually enhances the original stimulus. That is, it pushes us further away from set point. So if you look at the temperature analogy again, and you think about what would happen uh, under positive feedback, instead of your air conditioner turning on once it hit 80 degrees, your heater would actually turn on, and it would push you further and further away from the set point. Suffice it to say that positive feedback systems tend to be very rare within the mammalian body. So we've already looked at negative feedback systems when looking at our house and how temperature is regulated there, but now let's take a look at how temperature might be regulated in the mammalian body, for example in yourself or in your dog. Now both dogs and humans have a certain set point for body temperature. For humans it's around 98.6 and for dogs it's around 102.5. If temperature gets much higher than this, we say that we are hyperthermic, that is, we have too much body temperature, and if it gets lower than this, we become hypothermic, or too low body temperature. Now, suffice it to say, body temperature going too low or too high can be very bad, both of which can result in death. And so, both the dog and the human have a way to maintain their homeostasis using negative feedback. Now, when you're hot, what do you do? Well, you sweat. 
that sweat helps to evaporate and drive off some of that body heat which brings your temperature back down to 98.6. Now you probably already know that dogs don't sweat in the same way humans do. In fact, they get rid of most of their excess body heat by panting. And so if you put your dog in a car on a hot day, which I don't recommend doing, you'll see that they begin to pant and pant more and more and more, and that helps to dissipate this excess body heat and bring them back down to set point. On the other hand, if we put either yourself or your dog in a very cold condition, we'd see that they battle this hypothermia by shivering. And shivering is this involuntary muscle movement that helps to create body heat and bring us back towards our set point. And so both of these are examples of negative feedback because they tend to bring us back towards our set point for our controlled condition, which in this case is body temperature. Now body temperature is not the only thing that we maintain through negative feedback. We also help to maintain homeostasis of blood pressure using a negative feedback system. Now blood pressure is basically just the force of the blood inside the blood vessels and the primary force for this is the contraction of the heart and also the contraction or dilation of the blood vessels themselves. And so we know that having a very high blood pressure can be bad because that can lead to a rupture of a blood vessel or a stroke and having very low blood pressure can also be bad because this can lead to shock. And so the body has a way of maintaining uh, the blood pressure within certain ranges in order to keep that animal alive and healthy. So think about what would happen if your dog's blood pressure began to go higher than normal. Well, what would happen is the blood pressure is detected by baroreceptors within the carotid arteries. And those baroreceptors send a signal to the brain. And the brain analyzes that signal and generates an appropriate response through activating the effector. Basically the effectors here are the heart and the arterioles themselves. It tells the heart to slow down and beat less forcefully and it also tells the blood vessels to dilate or expand and this helps to bring the blood pressure back down towards the normal set point. So again this is another example of a negative feedback system. Okay, we're now going to shift gears and talk a little bit about basic anatomical terminology. If you're taking Health 125, you probably already covered it in this in lecture, but if not, I want to go ahead and cover it in lecture now because it's important to understand this terminology in order to do well in the laboratory portion of this course and also in order to understand what the veterinarian is saying to you in the exam room and also in the surgical suite. And so in today's lesson, we're going to cover the standard anatomical position, the regional terms that are used for cats, dogs, and horses, as well as specific directional terms. We're also going to talk about anatomical planes of sectioning and the different body cavities. Okay, let's take a look at the general body plan of your patients. Now, most of the patients that come into the veterinary hospital are going to be bilaterally symmetrical. And that means that the left side looks pretty much like the right side, at least on the outside. And so cats, dogs, horses, you name it, are all bilaterally symmetrical. Uh, the only exceptions that I can think of are things like sea urchins and sea cucumbers and sea anemones. So unless you work in an aquarium, you're probably going to see all bilaterally symmetrical organisms. Now, in these organisms, we refer to them when they're standing in standard anatomical position. And for quadrupedal organisms, that's an animal with all four legs on the ground and a snout pointing forward. Once we have that standard anatomical position in place, we can begin to refer to that animal using both regional and directional terms. Now our first regional term that we're going to learn is the muzzle. The muzzle is the front end of the organism where its nose or nostrils are located. Another name for the muzzle is the snout. The pole, on the other hand, is the top of the head between the bases of the ears. The withers, on the other hand, is an area just above or dorsal to the shoulder blades or scapula. If you are a horse rider, the pommel of your saddle will generally sit just in back of the withers. The brisket, on the other hand, is the area at the base of the neck between the front legs that covers the cranial end of the sternum, and cranial in here just means towards the head. So the brisket contains the big massive pectoralis muscles, and if you're looking at something like a steer, the brisket becomes something like corned beef. Uh, 
Hopefully you're not eating a whole lot of cat brisket or dog brisket or even horse brisket, but I sure do like me some good old cow brisket. The barrel, on the other hand, is the trunk of the body which is formed by the rib cage and also the abdomen. So this contains organs such as the lungs as well as the digestive and other abdominal organs. Now just caudal or in back of the barrel we have something called the flank. The flank is the lateral surface of the abdomen between the last rib and the hind legs. You've probably heard of the term flank before as in flank steak which is a cut of meat that comes from this area of a steer or cow. Now dorsal and caudal to the flank we have something called the tail head. The tail head is simply the area where the tail joins the body. Now the stifle is a joint that in humans we normally call the knee joint. But in horses and sometimes in cats and dogs we more often refer to this as the stifle joint. The stifle joint is the joint between the femur and the tibia and fibula and also the patella. So this is what again is called the knee joint in humans but in animals we call it the stifle joint. Now just distal to the stifle we have a muscular region called the gaskin. The gaskin is essentially uh, the calf muscle of the horse. So we tend to use the term gaskin with horses but not so much with dogs or cats. Now a few slides back we referred to the stifle joint which was the joint between the femur and the tibia. And, and normally in humans this is called the knee, but the reason we don't call this the knee in animals is because some animals actually have another knee. And this knee joint is actually in the front legs, and we only refer to this as the knee joint in hooved animals, for example horses, and it's actually the carpal joint, or similar to the wrist joint in humans. And so we call the wrist joint of horses the knee. Now in horses we have very long metacarpal and metatarsal bones and we refer to these collectively as the cannon bones. Maybe because they're so long they kind of look like a cannon. Now just distal to the knee and stifle joints we have a second joint which in horses we call the fetlock joints. And so we have a fetlock on the front legs and a fetlock on the back legs. And basically the fetlock is the metacarpal uh, phalangeal junction and the front legs and the metatarsal phalangeal junction or joint and the back legs. Now we don't tend to use the terms fetlock so much in cats and dogs. Instead we refer to the back joint there as the hock and the front joint there is the carpus. Now in the horse we refer to the regions below or distal to the fetlock joints as the pastern. The pastern actually consists of two bones, the short pastern bone and the long pastern bone, which are part of the digits of the horse. Now we're going to cover some directional terms which are commonly used in veterinary medicine. Now these directional terms are used to refer to the location of a structure in relation to another structure. For example, we can say that the nose is rostral or ahead of the sternum. So this is a way to give us a sense of direction on the body. Now we're only going to go through a few examples here in lecture class. You're going to spend a lot more time during the laboratory learning to use these directional terms and become proficient with them. Now this slide just shows an overview of some of the more common directional terms used in veterinary science. It's important to realize that most of these terms occur as opposites or antonyms. For example, let's take a look at the words dorsal and ventral. Dorsal means towards the animal's back. For example, if you're petting your dog as it's laying on the couch, you're petting its back and so you're petting its dorsal surface. On the other hand, if your dog turns over on his back to where his belly is exposed and you pet that, you're then petting its ventral surface. So dorsal means towards the dog's back surface and ventral means towards the dog's belly surface. The next two terms are medial and lateral. Medial means towards the midline of the body. For example, I would say that the spine is medial to the shoulder blades or scapula. That means it's towards the midline. On the other hand, I would say that the shoulder blades or scapula are lateral to the spine. That is, they're towards the side of the body, whereas the spine is towards the middle of the body. Lateral means towards the sides. Now we'll use terms lateral, dorsal, etc. a lot of times when we're talking about the recumbency of the animal. Because one of your jobs as a veterinary assistant or technician will be to restrain the animal during a veterinary exam or procedure. And the purpose of this restraint is to keep the animal safe but also allow the veterinarian to safely conduct their exam without being bitten.
And so depending on the procedure we're doing, we might have them in right lateral recumbency, that is laying on the right side. For example, we would do this if we were taking an x-ray. Uh, another type of recumbency is sternal recumbency. This is where the animal is sitting down on its sternum. For example, if you're making a blood draw from the jugular vein, you would probably put the animal in sternal recumbency. And finally, dorsal recumbency is where we have the animal lying on its back with its belly exposed. Dorsal recumbency. Now we're going to take a look at some directional terms which help us identify the front from the back of the animal. Okay, our first two terms are cranial and caudal. Cranial means towards the head or cranium of the animal, whereas caudal means towards the tail. For example, we could say that the withers are cranial to the tail head, that is, they're in front of the tail head. On the other hand, we could say that the tail head is caudal to the withers, that is, it's behind it. Now it's important to realize that the appendages also have cranial and caudal surfaces. For example, if we look at the foreleg, the cranial surface is the surface that faces forward, and the caudal surface is the surface that faces backwards. Just the same, we have a cranial surface to the thigh, and a caudal surface to the thigh as well. And so if the veterinarian will say to you that the animal or the dog has a lesion on the cranial part of its tibia, you would know that that would be on the cranial part of its shin bone and the back leg. Another directional term we have is rostral. Rostral just means in advance of the head towards the nose. The rostrum is the nose. And so we could say, for example, the nose is rostral or in front of the eyes. Now the next two terms are only used when referring to the position of something along an appendage, that is the legs. And these two terms are proximal and distal. Now proximal basically means towards the body, whereas distal means away from the body. For example, we could say that the elbow is proximal to the carpus or wrist because it's closer to the body than the wrist is. By the same token, we could say that the tarsus uh, is distal to the stifle because it's further away from the body than the stifle joint is. So proximal means closer to, and distal means further away from. Our next set of terms is deep and superficial. And again, these are opposites. Deep basically means towards the center of the body or a body part, whereas superficial means towards the outside. So we could say that a gunshot wound that penetrates you know, deep in the brain would be a deep injury. On the other hand, let's say an injury towards the outside of the cranium would be something that's relatively superficial because it's on the outside. Okay, we're going to shift gears once again and talk about anatomical planes. Now, anatomical planes describe an imaginary slice through an animal's body, and we use them as reference points to describe positions or to indicate how a part of the body is being viewed. And we commonly use them when we're talking about doing x-rays or CT scans, etc. And the three main planes that we're going to cover are the sagittal or median plane, the transverse plane, as well as the dorsal plane. Now, along with these three major planes, there's also something called an oblique plane, a parasagittal plane. So, in total, there may be as many as six major planes. Okay, our first major plane of sectioning is the dorsal plane. And the dorsal plane divides the body into a dorsal half and a ventral half. So, the dorsal is the back part and the ventral is the belly part. And so you can see this red plane here going through the dog, and we commonly use a dorsal plane when we're talking about certain types of x-rays. For example, the x-ray or radiograph at right shows a common VD section through the animal's body. That is, we shot an x-ray through the ventral part of the animal, and it came out on the dorsal part of the animal, which allows us to visualize the heart, the lungs, and the diaphragm. On the other hand, a transverse plane divides the body into cranial and caudal parts. For example, here you can see a horse that's been divided uh, into a front part or cranial part and a back part or caudal part by this transverse plane. Now, if you've ever cut up bananas for your cereal into cross sections, this is another example of a transverse plane. We don't use transverse planes so much with x-rays, but we do use them with CT scans and MRIs.
In fact, while searching the internet for examples of transverse planes, I came upon a very disturbing artist named Damien Hurst, who uh, basically chops animals up into different anatomical planes and preserves them and presents them as works of art. So here you can see a steer that's been cut up into three or four different pieces, and these are all examples of transverse sections. Now, on the other hand, a sagittal plane is a plane that divides the body into left and right halves. We call it a mid-sagittal plane or a median plane if the sagittal plane is right down in the middle of the body and the both halves are equal. On the other hand, if one half is bigger than the other half, we call it a parasagittal plane. So again, a sagittal plane is basically a longitudinal section. And so if you've ever made yourself a banana split, this would be an example of a sagittal section. You can also see this dog here has been divided uh, through the section into left and right halves using a median or mid-sagittal section. So just to recap, the three major planes are dorsal plane, which divides the body into top and bottom halves, a transverse plane, which divides the body into caudal and cranial halves, and a sagittal plane, which divides the body into left and right halves. And now we have something called an oblique plane. An oblique plane is just a combination of two or more sectioning planes. For example, you can see that this pig is cutting itself into what was going to be a transverse section, but you can see that the knife is entering higher on the right side than it's exiting on the left side. Because it's diagonal, we call this an oblique sectioning plane. That is a combination of a transverse plane and a sagittal plane. Okay, before we wrap up this lecture, we need to say something about body cavities. Now, the body of mammals is divided into a dorsal and a ventral cavity. The ventral cavity is probably the one that's most conspicuous to you, particularly if you've ever dissected anything. You know that the ventral cavity contains the heart, the lungs, as well as the abdominal organs, and it's a very conspicuous or obvious cavity. However, above that we have a much smaller but just as important cavity called the dorsal cavity. And the dorsal cavity is a space or a potential space around the brain and also the spinal cord. Now, the ventral body cavity can actually be subdivided into two separate subcavities, uh, a thoracic cavity and an abdominal cavity. Now, the thoracic cavity is also known as the cranial thoracic cavity, and within it we find major structures such as the heart, uh, major blood vessels such as the aorta, we also find the lungs, the trachea, the esophagus, and so on. Now, within the abdominal cavity, we find the following major structures. We find the digestive organs, such as the stomach, the liver, uh, the urinary organs, the reproductive organs, and so on. And so, just to recap, there are two different cavities in the body, the dorsal cavity, which houses the brain and spinal cord, and a ventral cavity, which houses everything else.